this time on Jester's Garage, we're going to show you the backstory on this 38 Chevy Coupe. Rick and his dad drove this thing out of a snowbank back in 72. Young Rick helped his dad build an engine for this car when he was 11, 12 years old. And after his dad had owned it for a couple years, he decided he was going to punt this car. Rick's like, Dad, I want that car. So, after he ponied up what his dad wanted for this car, this is before his driver's license, he takes it to the school shop, and him and his buddies replace all the rust in the floor, they did a bunch of stuff to it, he starts driving this. This was his high school hot rod in the 70s. And during his high school years, he knew he wanted to race this car. So after he graduated, he started racing. And after a little stint of racing, he decided to turn this thing into a street rod. He gets the paint done, and there it sets. 40 years. It's time to get this girl back on the road. So, follow along as Rick tells you the story of his high school hot rod coming up right now. Uh, Rick, what's the history of this car? Well, my dad bought this car from a guy he worked with uh, at the mill in Brainerd, Minnesota in about 1972 or so. And I went with him and we dug it out of a snowbank out in Baxter, Minnesota. So how old were you in 72? I know you're about one or two years older than I am. I was 12. You're 12. So you yeah. weren't Actually, I was 11, yeah, but I was okay. 60. I was yeah. 11, I think, when we dug it out. Right. Because there was still snow on the ground. So, so this was in a snowbank, you say? Yeah, it was, it was buried in snow. Okay. Um, and it, it didn't run. It's a 38. Yep. How old of a car was it? Uh, let's see. 34. 34. 34 years old. 34 years old. Yep. Gosh, the car was 34 years old and got it, and I've owned it for almost 50. Yeah, wow. Okay, so you were 11, and you helped your dad work on this car. Actually, this was the first V8 engine I ever built was for this car. I think I was about 13 years old. Okay. 12 or 13, we, we built a 283 for it. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, when I was about 14, my dad decided he was going to sell it. He didn't drive it very much. And... Uh, Boy, I'll tell you, I was I was heartbroken. I had to have the car. Right. And so he had already put it for sale. And I told him, I said, Dad, I, I want to buy that car. Yeah. How much? And he said, Well, you can see what is what I'm asking for. I had to pay him what he's. How what much said, was it? Nine hundred bucks. Nine hundred bucks. Yeah. So this is a running driving car at this point. Kind of. Kind of. It was. It was not. Actually, I think I paid fourteen hundred. Wow. It was either That's a chunk of change. Yeah, That's a chunk of change in, what, mid-70s? Yeah, for 74. A, wow. For a 14-year-old kid. Yeah. What, what's the age of driving? Uh, in 16. 16 in Minnesota. Yep. So you had a couple years to really get some work to it. So, you know, when I bought it from him, I wanted to... Uh, the floor was bad. It didn't drive very good. Uh, I started right from the front, and I put a different, I put a 6-inch drop axle, 6-inch oh, tube wow. drop axle in it. It had a straight axle on that. Of course, yeah. Oh, so yeah, because some of these were independent and some were straight axles. Yeah, this had a straight axle on it when we got it from the guy's name was Les Museus, my dad bought it from. Les Museus? Museus. He worked at the Coder at the paper mill. Which oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. It had a, an old straight axle in it. I think it was out of a truck or something. Oh. I'm not. I'm not certain if that was the original or not. Okay. I'm looking at the chassis. It didn't look like it was one of the independent suspension ones. It looks like it was a straight axle car. Okay. But uh, I bought a six inch drop axle and put in there. That's a lot of drop. Yeah. I bet it was. Oh, I wanted to have the no <laughs> dot. <laughs> hey, yeah, classic seven yeah. break, right? So then uh, I was 15 in 10th grade mm -hmm. and brought it to school mm -hmm. and we finished up that floor. I started that floor, uh, I replaced the whole floor from the front to the back. I started it when I was 14 and, and uh, finished it up in 10th grade at, at high school. Okay. I didn't have a license yet anyways, and the shop teacher, coincidentally, his name was Bob House, no relation. Oh, wow. Yeah, just cool. a, but a great guy. Yeah. Great waller, great teacher, and a great friend. Uh, he let me bring it in and 
So a bunch of my buddies got to work on it, and, and uh, we put the floor in. And, and this is Minnesota, so yeah. rusted floors are pretty common. Everything was rusted. Yeah. An old GM rear end in it, mm -hmm. and I left that in there to start with. Mm -hmm. And uh, got the running gear all done, and I, I built a different 327 and put it in there. I don't think I had a tunnel ram on it in high school, but I might have. <laughs> and uh, had Hedman headers, Fender well headers. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, the old Hedman headers. Yeah. Uh, those came with it, actually. Oh? Yeah. yeah, Les had those with the car. Okay. So it it had a V8 when your one dad got it. So, in other words, this wasn't an original car. No, huh? it was already been hot rodded oh, by somebody. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was oh. already had the zebra hide interior. Oh, wow. I have a piece to show you. That's oh, beautiful. beautiful. And it was painted purple. Purple was Purple. super high in mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> Yeah, it was a real damn. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah so that, then, uh, you know, after I got the, the floorboard and everything, then we put it back on the chassis and wired it up and got it running. And it was my driver once I got my driver's license finally. Right. Right? Yeah. And I drove it to school. Yeah. And it had a big old thumper cam and mm -hmm. it, it sounded nasty. And it wasn't near as fast as I thought it was probably, but, fast enough but it was plenty fast, yeah. yeah. And it was fun. Yeah. You're 16 years old, you got 327 in it, and you're in high school. What was your plans for this car at that point? Well, a, a couple of my really good buddies, uh, my buddy Tim Sweet, he was really into cars too. And mm -hmm. So of course we were always talking about how fast all our stuff was. Right? Right. You know, my plan at the time, I wanted to race it. After I drove it to school through high school, okay, and uh, about the time I was done with high school, I turned it into a race car. I tore the interior out of it, I put a roll cage in it, uh, built a different engine for it, a 350, 355 actually. Oh, wow. Uh, took the, I had a Muncie uh, M22 in there. Wow, the rock crusher. Yeah, I had a rock crusher in there. Uh, that's not what was in there to start with, but that's what I had in that's there. That's what you basically yeah. got. To. And I took that out and I had a turbo 400 to go for it. Okay. That it never, never did get it to work. And I had all these big rings I was going to be a, you know, a world-class race car and it was going to set the world on fire. I, I had transmission troubles so much I never really did get to make a full pass on power. Wow. Yeah. And this is... The transmission, and the funny note I got to add that my wife now, uh, we weren't dating in high school, we started dating right after high school, but we knew each other for, gosh, seventh grade, I think we met. Wow, cool. And she has never actually ridden in the car, but when I was racing the car, she helped me work on it. Oh, how about that? Yeah, cool. she yeah. never rode it. Wow. Yeah, she'd help me take the transmission. It seemed like every run I had to pull the transmission out and pick something. From the outside looking in, it looks like this car was put on the shelf for about 40 years, but you say there was a good reason why it didn't get worked on. Yeah, maybe 81. I decided that, I, two things, I didn't have enough money to race how I wanted to. That was, we were poor. I mean, like, like you are when you start out, we didn't have anything. Right. And so, uh, I put the car in the back burner, I decided I was going to make it into a street rod instead of a race car. Okay. But in the interim, not having any money, I was building cars for other people, other street rods, building engines for people. I uh, actually started a business called Rick House's Performance Specialty. Wow. And really started out strong in street rods and drag cars, and then migrated more to dirt track engines and stuff. But I quit racing this and started that business. Between then and 82, I was able to rat hole enough money to get it painted. My intention was to still you know, get go ahead with the car and do it as I could afford, which wasn't very fast, but yeah. Uh, anyways, I brought it to that body shop, Quality Auto Body in Minnesota. And the guy that painted my Corvette was no longer there, but uh, actually a really good friend of mine now, his brother, Wade Arnold, my brother, my buddy Brad Arnold, his little brother, or older brother, was the painter there. Mm -hmm. He's the one who actually painted this, so the paint is, it's candy tangerine yeah. with a black pearl base, and it's old House of Colors black. Oh, wow. There's oh, like, yeah. There's wow. like 36 coats of paint on this thing. <laughs> you got the primer, the, then it was painted black, mm -hmm. then it was painted pearl white, then the candy tangerine, and then the clear. Wow. So it, was in, it took forever to paint it. Well, then 
we had by then we had two kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we needed to figure out. Life so takes over. It did. And so you know, I had to build the house, had to clear the land, and this got put on the back burner. It and sat in the garage. Yeah, never outside. Never sat outside. Oh, and I had built a, a really stout 355 car by then, too. With a big roller cam. And, wow, uh, roller cam back then. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, I had tunnel ram and Brodix heads. It was, it's, I still have them over. Yeah. All those ducks were in a row, but life takes over. Life took over. It was just no time. I ended up building snowmobile races. Racers, wow. Racing snowmobile engines and clutches and doing all that. And so it's, it sat on the back burner of my shop there. And most of the stuff you're building, you're building for customers. All customer stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're sitting there building and building and building. And never time for my own stuff. Right. But in the interim, you know, there was, I've had a few people that wanted to buy this, but I bought it from my dad. Yeah. yeah. And no, it's, you know, things are not for sale. There's, there's, there's no price that could buy this car. So it'll stay in our family somewhere. Yeah, hopefully my son will want it. Yeah. I'm sure he will. Yeah, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And hopefully it'll I know be a my long little, time. I know both my little brothers will. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> awesome. So you did all of this mechanic and you're building snowmobile racers and NASCAR engines and, and street rods and so forth. And somehow, some way, you must have got into paper machines because you moved over here 2001-ish. Yeah. And you knew you knew paper machines because they hired you as a big shot. Okay, I was actually an engine machinist at the Scorpion Stallville plant in okay. Crosby. Okay. Well, then they went to work one day and they shut it down. They said, you're oh. done. Wow. We're shutting down at the end of the you week. You showed up and your job was over. Yeah. Wow. So I'm 19 years old. Okay. Uh, married. Yeah. And poor. Right. <laughs> so I called my dad and I said, dad, any chance they're, they're hiring at the mill? And he said, yeah, he said, my dad, dad worked, my dad was a supervisor at the, oh, in the coder at okay, the mill and okay, okay. And back then, if you had a dad that worked, you could, he could get you hired. Right on, right on. So I went to work there. I said, I'm not going to stay here very long. I'm just going to stay here long enough to figure out what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, it ended, it ended up to be like 38 years. But <laughs> Oh, so the whole time you've got this business on the side. Oh, yeah. you it's were, on the you, side. You were working at the mill the whole time. I was the whole time. I didn't realize that. Yep. So my oh, wife right. did most of the, for the parts business part of my business. Mm -hmm. My wife, I'd give her a list in the morning when I got off of work and of all the deliveries to make for the day. She'd deliver the parts. And I would do the book work and the ordering in the morning and she'd deliver the parts and I'd sleep for a little bit, get up and go in the shop and work for a little you're bit and go to work. You're juggling two careers. Yeah. But you know, it, I mean, as when you're, when you want some things and yep. you don't have anything, yep. you got to work to get them. And so that's what we did. Yeah, I did the same thing. Uh -huh. We're in the interview. That's okay. We'll move <laughs> Man, that'll be all part of it. That's all good. <laughs> no. It, it's, it's okay, it, George. It's okay, George. George. It's okay. Right, you go look at the paint no. again. <laughs> no. The early 90s, I was in my early 30s, and I was the machine superintendent in Brainerd at the mill. Okay. And uh, they were having runnability issues out here. Mm -hmm. And in the 96, 97 time frame, mm -hmm. uh, they started sending me out here every now and then to help with the machines. Oh, like a... Troubleshooter, yeah, kind of, yeah. 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 And so I knew some of the guys here, and I had the opportunity to come here in 2001. Okay. Uh, we packed up and moved. Was that mill a Popatch mill? Yes, it was Popatch. So you were working for Popatch. I was. And that's why you were a consultant because I was here to like I when was, I went to Arkansas. Right. You went, you know, you went down there for a while. Right. right. You know, I did. And you, so I worked at the mill in Brainerd, the mill in Cloquet. The mill out here, oh, the mill in Arkansas, I've been at all. Yeah, so you were bouncing around and yeah. all of a sudden there was an opportunity for you in Lewiston. Right. Great opportunity. Yeah. And Debbie and I had always talked about moving out to the Northwest. We really? almost moved here in the mid 80s. Yeah. Wow. yeah. I so uh, we packed up and moved. And I had no idea when I moved here, outside of the mill, I had no idea yeah. what a yeah. mecca this was for car building. Yeah. It was. I was shocked when I saw all the street rods and cars and the neat stuff out here. It doesn't rust that fast over here. No, things don't rust. And I kept telling my little brother Pat that. I said, man, Pat, there's nice cars. So he was buying cars out here and hauling them back. Oh, no kidding. Oh, yeah, he'd drive out and haul big and load back. And, <laughs> yeah. Fast forward about, what, 
40, 45 years, <laughs> you're retired. My plan was when I retired, I buy, got a mill, I bought a lathe, I got mace, tape, arc welder, gas welder, nice saws, all that stuff. I was going to build the car. Yeah. And then my wife got cancer again for the third time. Wow. So that changed everything. She's being knit. You are bound and determined to get her in this She's going to get a ride in this car. Yes. Right. So in the yeah, fall of 2017, they gave her three months to live. Wow. And she's still here. That's awesome. So Crazy. that's a miracle in itself. Yeah. But I just realized that, you know, when she has good days, I'm not going to be down in my shop working on this car. Right. We're going to go screw off and do something. Right. So my little brother was having... I bought a 32 High Boy kit car from okay. Ron Rohde. Oh, yeah, one of those <laughs> yeah. that he could put yep. together. Right. And so he brought it up to Andy. Oh, yep. And I met Andy, and I thought, I told Pat, I said, I ought to have Andy maybe build me a chassis for that car. Or at least take a look at it and see what he thinks about putting a four lane on it. Because I had narrowed the frame in the mid 80s. Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, narrowed the frame and put a nine inch board under it. So. Mm -hmm. Andy came down from his shop in Viola and mm -hmm. came to my shop and looked at it. And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that. To start with, I really wasn't interested in doing quite as extensive as where we're headed now. Yeah. But once I got to thinking about it, I thought, why not? I right. mean, you know, if, I, if that's what I've always wanted to do, mm -hmm. why not do it now? Yeah. Because time's done. running out. Yeah. And everything that's being done is being done, right? Yeah, and you know, after I met Andy, and he, he talked about Rob, and I had always seen Rotten Leonard Jalopy Shop, the sign there, and I always thought, man, that's a cool name. I wonder what it's like back yeah. Well, then he got a hold of Rob, and, and uh, so now Andy's going to do the chassis. Rob's doing the metal work, and when I decided I wanted to chop the top, and Andy got a hold of, of Rob, and he said he would do it, well, here we go. Right on. So uh, we have made... Great progress. Yeah, I'm anxious, really anxious to get it going and, and uh, see it back on the chassis. Right. And, but I got the engine built, got a new transmission for it. I got to get some different gears for the rear end. But yeah, the hot rod shop up in uh, Green Valley by Spokane, I had them build a, a board and stroke uh, LS3. Oh, wow. Yeah, 427 inch. Oh, wow. 625 horse. Oh, brother. <laughs> So even though I was an engine builder for all those years, yeah. I just figured, you know what, I, I have never done an LS. Right. All my stuff was, you know, small block Chevy, big block Chevy, right. small Fords, Chryslers, and all that stuff. So this new all electronic stuff. Is You've already proven yourself, and you've had a lot of people come to you to have stuff done. And sometimes you get to that point in your life where you just want to have somebody do something good for you, and this has happened. You know, and, that, and that's right, too. And, you know, it's, uh, I don't quite have the ambition I used to have. Either. I'm very driven to see this car done, mm -hmm. see it through, and drive it. Uh, yeah, and I'm really happy to be so blessed to be able to meet guys like Rob and Andy and you. Uh, I met you through the mill years right. ago. We had a lot of fun. Yeah, that's fun. And it's going to continue to be fun. Yeah. We're doing some neat stuff. So let's talk about your vision for this car. I mean, we know it's going to, it has this really special chop top. It's going to have a mandrel bent two frame. It's got the LS3, the board and stroke to a 427. Ridiculous horsepower. I don't know how big those meats are, but Rob says they're bigger than your mom's butt, not your mom's. <laughs> mom. Tiger's going on it. Uh, they're 19 inches wide, 31 inches tall. Wow, and they're going to be on 20 inch wheels. And I'll tell you, that was uh, that was a huge decision for me, trying to decide what wheels to put on it. And once I decided what wheels I wanted, then I was gonna, that was kind of dictate the tire size. I'm a little old school, and I wanted the car to reflect that. You know, with, with the wheels that I picked out. Uh, so the next next tire size up had a bigger sidewall, mm -hmm. but it was also three three and a half inches wider wow, tire. Wow, that's okay. Yeah, exactly. like my buddy Ed Jensen said, make sure you leave enough room for the drive shaft. Yeah, <laughs> about that much. Right? Yeah, yeah. So what's the color? 
boy, I've struggled with that. That's that's as hard as is picking out the wheels. Yeah. My original color, this this candy tangerine with the black pearl base, was originally just going to be candy tangerine. Mm -hmm. uh, I painted my Harley a custom color from a a uh, friend of mine in Fargo that mixed up, and uh, it's orange, and it's, it's beautiful orange color. I, I looked at orange possibly, or something maybe a real dark brandy wine kind of candy color. It's gonna be something unique for sure. And you got time to figure that out. Yeah, hopefully not too much time. No, hopefully we can get going. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. you got a month, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, by the time the metal's done and they start, you know, massaging the surface, right. You got a certain amount. You bet. So I want the car down in the weeds in the front for sure. I want it low in the back. I don't want it sitting like this. I want it down in the weeds. And, and now the tip of these A pillars, the stance of the car and how it looks, uh, it really struck me today with the window with the door being open, how it's how it's pitched forward. Uh, I think down in the weeds with this being tipped back, I think this car is going to look amazing. Yeah, and the wheels that I picked, they're, they're Amer American Racing BF 531s. They're a five spoke with a little bit of an open window, and so a little mix of old school, mm -hmm. little mix of new school, but yeah, I thought that was important too. Next up on Jester's Garage, we're gonna show the process that Rob and Nate did. Leaning this windshield back and doing a super, super cool shop. Also, I'll be heading up to Viola at Hell's Gate Hot Rods. Andy is building this chassis that's gonna make this thing handle like a dream. So you've gotta check that one out. Thanks for watching this episode of Jester's Garage, and we'll see you next time. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe.